glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. the mighty God. You are the mighty God. You who go down to the sea, you who live in the islands, oh, if you live in the city, lift your voice and sing out. Sing out, glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God, you are the mighty God. Sing to the Lord a new song, sing his praise to the ends of the earth. Let every nation tell it, declare it, till every man is heard. Sing out glory, glory, Lord, we give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God, you are the mighty God. Nani nani Yehova, no ka nani Yehova, nani nani Yehova, ke akua mana loa. Vi ia, vi ia le tua, ma tote via o le tua. Vi ia, vi ia le tua, o o le tu mata utia. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Glory, glory. Glory, glory, Lord, we give you glory, Lord, and we do. Greetings <clears throat> from the Parkview Church of Christ. This is Larry Tittle, and I'm the preaching minister for this great church here, and looking forward to our continued journey through the Psalms. There's been a lot going on in our world. The Ukraine situation continues and people are being killed on both sides. Some killed in defending their country, others just being massively murdered by the invading country. And we continue to pray for that. Shootings within our own country, senseless. And we need, to, we need to pray for that. And maybe there's issues within your community even that, uh, that need some prayer. But it's good to have you with us today. We are in the 37th Psalm today, a rather long one. And so this is going to be one of those times when, I don't know, maybe I should divide it into several lessons. But I'm not going to do that. We've dedicated ourselves to one Psalm Per session and we're going to stick with that today and I think we can we can get the gist of that as has been the case in most of these Psalms I always begin with a question and so the same is true the same is true for today and the question for today is what would it take what would it take in your life or maybe even in the world for you to say I give up just what would it take we might sit here this morning and say well there's nothing nothing that could happen to me to my family there's no development in the world that could be rising up out there that it would make me say, I give up. 
And if you can say that, that's that's great. And I think maybe we all would say it or at least like to say it. But how do you confirm that in your life? How do you make that a determination without negotiation? How do you do that? Well, I believe today's psalm helps us out there. And so let's, uh, let's turn to it. And again, we'll do our overview of the psalm first, and then we'll read it together. So if we have 40 verses within the 37th psalm, and for me, it's divided into, into four sections. The first section, uh, verses 1 through 11, are the encouragement to resist, resist the lure of the wicked and desiring their lifestyle. Resist that. We can have a lot to say about that later. The second section of the psalm begins, uh, begins in verse 12 and goes all the way to verse 20. And this is just an explanation or a description of how the wicked plot harm, but God, God protects the faithful. And again, there's a lot that can be said there about how that happens, and we will say something about that this morning. We certainly can't cover it all. The third section begins in verse 21 and goes through verse 26, and fundamentally it talks about how the faithful, those who are faithful, are generous in their benevolence, in particular in their even lending their own money. Then the final section, verses 27 uh, through the end of the chapter, is now back to an, an exhortation to resist the evil and cling to righteousness. And that's the righteousness that you and I have today because of Jesus Christ. He gave us his righteousness and took on our sin on the cross. And that's... Uh, Quite an unfair exchange, isn't it? But nevertheless, a necessary exchange. And so that's how the, the psalm, at least for us this morning, kind of breaks down. And so let's uh, just get a big breath and let's read this together and then make comments about it. For a superscription, um, in my Bible, it just says, Of David. And so it almost seems as if David is reflecting on his life with respect to the times of trouble in his life at the hands of the wicked and the times of blessing in his life, of course, at the hand of God. And this is typically referred to as the wisdom psalm in so many cases because it does reflect wisdom. But beyond that, much of the wisdom that it reflects can all be found in the book of wisdom, Proverbs as well as in other, uh, other books of the Bible, such as the prophets. And so let's begin reading. The 37th Psalm of David, verse 1, Fret not yourself because of the evildoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the new day. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. 
But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine they have abundance. But the wicked shall perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young and now am old. But yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him, abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land you will look on when the wicked are cut off. I've seen a wicked man, ruthless man, spreading himself like a green laurel tree. But he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. The transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the, gener of the righteous, is, righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold. In the time of trouble, the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Quite a reading, right? It's, it's very similar to some things we've, we've talked about so many times, okay? And maybe we need to remind ourselves of them. There's teaching out there, and you may have heard it, especially if you've listened to some of the television preachers, that giving yourself to Jesus Christ makes all your troubles go away, and life will become a smooth, smooth train ride. And people hear that, and they buy it, and they discover that their life is not a smooth train ride. It's more like a roller coaster ride. And there are ups and there are downs and there are some good ups and there are some really profound downs. And we, we need to know that even in this psalm, though there's many promises from God about being with and delivering his people and uh, being a refuge for them, he also states very plainly that there's going to be some downs. He says, when they take you to trial. He doesn't say, I'm going to keep you from going to trial. But when they take you to trial, when the troubles come, when the wicked comes after you. And so the, the roller coaster ride does have its down times. I'm not saying it's a faithless time. I'm just saying that's the way life is, and there's a devil out there, and the devil has his advocates, the devil has his followers, and they produce nothing but trouble for everyone, including those who follow Jesus Christ. And so this 
psalm of wisdom in essence tells us what to always do even in the times of trouble and i think that's the lesson for today what how are we always going to be at least to the to the best of our ability how are, how are we going to be and really we wouldn't need to go any further than the first three verses because the first three verses give us the encouragement. Now, there's, there's lots of these one or two word encouragements in this psalm. But these first three may be summaries of the entire psalm. For in verse 1, he's going to say, fret, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like green herb. And so... And so here he says, look forward, okay? Look into the future if, if we can. And so there may be no immediate end to whatever the wicked uh, are perpetrating and maybe whatever is coming into your, your life because of those. But looking forward, he's saying, they will come to their end. And you, and you know that's true. And we're not really talking just about the end of the world when Jesus comes, and we know it's going to happen then. But, but even in this life, the, the evil that they're perpetrating toward you is going to come to an end as they will come to an end. And so that's a forward-looking faith, even, even in the midst of fretting. And he says, fret not. Don't do that. Don't fret over these things that are, that are happening either to you or in the world because these are going to come to an end as well as those who are, who are perpetrating them. So look forward and then look up. Look up would be verse 2. Trust in the Lord. Verse 4, and delight yourself in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. That's an interesting expression, isn't it? befriend faithfulness let faithfulness be your friend i bet we've never thought about it that way have we a friend is someone you cherish someone you who you like to be with someone who is part of your life and he's saying let faithfulness be like that to you a friend is someone you depend on a friend is someone you listen to can faithfulness be like that in your life? If it is, if it is, it will ride with you, of course, through the ups in this roller coaster, and it will also ride with you through the downs. Furthermore, if faithfulness is your friend, number three, then you're going to do good. You're just going to do good. Some of the do good is explained later in this psalm over in, in verses 21 through 25. It, it, verse 21 says, the wicked borrows but does not pay back. We could kind of stop right here and say, you know, if someone has lent you something and you haven't given it back or paid it back, you're being lumped with, in this verse, the wicked. Don't let that happen. And if you have trouble paying it back, talk to them. I bet the one who is generous enough to lend it to you will probably work with you or may say, forget it. But don't be lumped with the wicked. And so the those who are of faith, those who are of righteous, they're generous and give. And when they do, for those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. And so the, the good that we do is presenting ourself and what God has blessed us with to the aid and assistance of other people. Do good. Now we can journey through this psalm and we can, we can find significant uh, encouragements here. We have trust and delight, verses 3 and 4. Now we have commit, okay? Commit yourself to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. And notice the promise there. Commit yourself to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. And on the end of that is not like we want it or like we 
think he ought to. It's just he will act. And you can you can find so many cases in Scripture where the Lord's actions may not have been immediately because he wasn't interested in particularly remedying the current situation, but remed, but uh, but healing the down the road causes what caused it to be that way in the first place. And that's sometimes the way God acts. When it comes to our salvation, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he's giving ample time for that to happen. I say quite often, I'm ready for him to come right now. Obviously, he's not ready. It's not time. God's timetable is never our timetable, typically, and so we have to, as our, ver as our passage says today, we have to wait. We have to wait on the Lord. We have to, in verse 7, be still. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. When was the last time, even in the downhill side of life, in the downhill side of that roller coaster, have you just stopped and waited on the Lord? You know, our, our world, our society, our lives don't allow for that, it seems. Because waiting says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some things on pause here to observe how God is or might act. That, that requires some quiet time. That requires some being still. And we're just not in that society. So we have to make up our minds that we're going to do it. And when was the last time that we did it? He'll come again there in verse, uh, in verse 7 and say, and don't fret. But in this case, he says, don't fret over the one who is unrighteous yet prospering. You might remember the question I asked in the, in the beginning about what would it take? What would it take for you to just give up and say, it's, it's no use. I'm just going to give in. I'm just going to give in to what the world has to offer. Because it seems like so many out there who are unfaithful, those who don't believe, are the ones prospering. And so I may just join them. And so he says here, don't, don't fret about that situation. Don't worry about that. God is going to take care of and prosper you. We have to let him define the word prosper. We have to be willing. We have to be willing to be, be carried into his care. But don't fret about what you see out there. There's, there's a lot more in encouragement here. Uh, it seems like that Jesus quotes verse 11 over in the Sermon on the Mount. But the, bleak, the meek shall inherit the land. And over in the at Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And who's the meek? And, and I think the meek are those who, who defer to God. Okay, they're the ones who don't insist on having it their way, doing it their way, everybody doing it like them. But but they defer to God. And that's not weakness, that's meekness. It's actually the opposite of me of weakness, it is strength to give in and give up to God. Interesting verse 13 it says, "But the Lord laughs at the wicked." He sees that his day is coming. Isn't that an interesting picture? Here's the wicked down here thinking they're getting along in life great. They're getting everything they want at the expense of, of people. And God's up there laughing at him, saying, you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. And our phrase is, what goes around comes around. And so it's as if the Lord takes delight in those where we're commanded, back over in, in verse 4, that we need to delight in him. And so our, our focus needs to be on God. Our, our attention needs to be directed toward God. We need to be listening for God. We need to be reading his word and not observing what's happening to everybody out there that in some way we may like to be like. But the Lord laughs at all the things the wicked are doing. The 
a wicked uh, plot harm, but God, God, God offers protection and refuge. Verse 16 says, Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. There's a song out there that goes, Better is one day in the house of the Lord, in the house, than a bunch of days. You know, in, in the house of the abundant, in the house of the, of the world. And maybe that's uh, what we need to do, is we need to maybe redefine redefine the word better here. What's better? What's best? And I think if, if, we're, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we know in our minds at least that it's always what God wants is best and how God works is best. But sometimes we forget that when we're inundated with the world. And maybe we just need to turn off the world. And again, that's almost impossible, isn't it? But maybe we just need to take those moments of silence, turn off the television, don't read the newspaper, don't listen to anybody, and just reimagine the better things, the better things of God. Verses 21 to 25, we've already talked about the generosity of God's people using their things they've been given to help others. When, when, when David says in verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. He is ever, he is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. And, and it, that's, uh, that's a statement we need to understand. For God's people were fundamentally poor people, but they had, they had the everyday needs of life. So he's not, ta he's not saying that God's going to make you rich no matter what the television preachers say. And so David can say, I've seen, I've seen the faithful people of God and they've always had their daily needs. Now we can read of times uh, there in our Old Testament where the poor people were treated unjustly by the rich. And that the, the rich were taking advantage of the poor and taking their what little things they had. And, and there's a cry out from God against those people and what they're doing and things like that happen. But I think I could make the same statement that, that David makes, that I've never seen those who are faithful to God not have the daily necessities of life. They may not have a car. They may, may not have the nicest of house or apartment or trailer. But they have the basic needs of life and added to that the faithful of God should be uh, finding help from the faithful of God and that's a, that's a resource that that the household of God remember ha can call on we're told in the New Testament to do that very thing help those who need help especially those of the household of God that's a resource that we have. Well, we're going to have to we're going to have to wind this up, and we've really hurried through it. The last section of the script of this uh, psalm, verses twenty-seven through forty, are another exhortation to reject evil. When you see when you see the evil doer out there, and you might even see him being worldly successful then stop it, okay, stop it. Look at what's really going on. Who's he hurting, who's he cheating, who is he undermining to, to acquire the things he has? So stop it, resist that, rather cling to righteousness. Verse 34, one more time, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. That is, there it is again. The, the land that you will look on when the wicked are cut off. And so it's anticipating. It's anticipating that you can, you can observe the wickedness in the land and it can even try to come into your house and maybe it will resist and wait, resist 
and wait. Resist on wait and wait and let the Lord work in his time. Maybe if we go back to the question that we started with, we could, uh, in, an, in an affirmative way, say there's nothing, there is nothing that can happen. There is no circumstance that I might find myself in. There is nothing that I may have done that will keep me from giving up on the Lord and renouncing my faithfulness to him and joining the ways of the wicked. Nothing can do that. We are empowered to do everything that this psalm tells us to do. To wait, to be still, to commit. Look up, look forward. God expects us to do that and empowers us to do so and gives us the tools in our lives to make that happen. So take confidence there. No matter, no matter what we're seeing around us in our world or maybe in our own neighborhood, no matter, we will never, never, never give up. Okay, Psalm 38 next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you. Lord, we give you glory, Lord, glory, glory, Lord, you are the mighty God, you are the mighty God.